good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, this is the seminar of uh, Essay Kirene on uh, multilateralism. And I'm Philippe Lecour uh, from uh, ESSEC, uh, delighted to uh, host you. And I will uh, give the floor now to my colleague, Professor um, Joseph Maila, uh, who is standing for uh, Professor Aurélien Cosson, and who will, um, who will give us uh, the big picture that's much needed uh, to uh, set the stage for this, uh, for this seminar. So, um, Joseph, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Lecour de Philippe. A very good morning, a late good morning, I, I must say, but also a very early good evening because we are joined by some friends coming from uh, East Asia and especially Ambassador Ishi was joining us. Thank you for being with us today and a very warm welcome to you today at this uh, seminar, a sex seminar on the future of multilateralism. I'm Joseph Myler. Uh, I'm professor at ESSEC, and I have the pleasure and the honor uh, to open this video conference session on behalf, as it has just been said, on behalf of Professor Aurélien Colson, who is away. Um, Aurélien Colson is the director of IRENE. And IRENE is a department within the ESSEC Business School dedicated to the research and education on uh, negotiation. So this institute is very much eager to organize and we do organize a lot of conferences, seminars on the world system, on global affairs. And uh, in this context, I am very happy uh, to welcome the distinguished panelists that we uh, will have today, we have today with us. Uh, my colleague Philippe Lecor will uh, introduce them proper way, but I would like to welcome uh, Sir Paul Tucker, uh, Ambassador uh, Ishi, Ambassador Jean Maurice Ripper, and Professor Frédéric Charion. But I would like also to extend my thanks to Philippe Lecor who was instrumental in setting up and organizing our today meeting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we are tackling the issue of the, um, the multilateral system. Uh, I'm sure that each of us will depend it, will portray it the way it feels, but uh, there is a common feeling that this uh, multi multilateral system is today uh, facing tremendous difficulties. And um, the many issues that are related uh, to the international system today uh, reflect the image um, of a creaking system uh, unable, unable to adapt to global change, um, powerless to come up with solution uh, to the multiple crises that we are facing today. And um, of course, the Ukraine case and the Gaza one would be uh, crucial in explaining or trying to illustrate what is happening on the international stage. But we can also add so many issues related to WTO, the, to the late conference on, 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 uh, on, the, on trade, or we can also tackle the issue of uh, climate change uh, and the related uh, measures that are waiting um, to, to be taken in this, uh, in this field. So many questions will, will come up with all this uh, very quick um, way of depicting the situation that we are living today. Um, is, and this, these are the questions that I'm just putting to the uh, wisdom uh, of our panelists. Is the this diagnosis relevant when we say that um, there is a, a, an incapacity of the multilateral system to deal with many issues on many levels? At the same time, we must know that there is a huge discrepancy between the international political level, which is really faced with many problems on the political uh, on political cases. But at the same time, we are witnessing a kind of business as usual 
when it comes to the many international intergovernmental organization uh, dealing with health, WTO, uh, energy, and so many issues that are common goods, if I might say, that are doing their business at the same time. While on the political system, on the political level, the system that has been set up in the aftermath of World War II is facing tremendous difficulties. Um, is that, Does it mean that this international system, um, the United Nations one, uh, need to be reshaped today? Um, is the international system uh, that was set up after, in the aftermath of World War II uh, has come to an end? Uh, how can we boost uh, a new system maybe of... Uh, uh, partnerships in the world? I don't know. These are questions to be really um, answered and at least uh, addressed. And when it comes to the issues, the causes that uh, have led to this situation that we are witnessing today is that the cause is mainly the issue of the rise of nationalism in the world, unilateralism, rivalry between great powers and many attacks coming from many um, many ways and, and and directions on an international system order based on treaties and international law how can we deal also with the ever growing divide between what we call the global south and the G7 uh, do we agree on values that have really been at, at the root of the international system. Uh, when we uh, read, for example, the joint statement between Russia and uh, China uh, that was delivered in February 2022, just a few days before the invasion of Ukraine, and in which in this statement, Russia and uh, uh, China were saying that, well, we do respect the universal rights and the world but you know each country each civilization each uh, nation has its own values and we have to look at global affairs from a point of view of very specific uh, uh, situation of each of our nation so i leave these questions to 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 the panelists and i, I leave the floor also uh, to uh, Philippe. Thank you so much, Philippe, and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, very great uh, uh, words of introduction. And uh, let me introduce uh, our speakers uh, uh, very uh, briefly. Um, uh, so first, um, uh, Ambassador Jean-Maurice uh, Ripper, uh, who is a distinguished uh, French ambassador who was posted uh, in, uh, in Greece, in Russia, in uh, China. Um, he was uh, uh, France's uh, representative to the United Nations, both in New York and Geneva. He was also deputy uh, uh, secretary general of the United Nations and diplomatic advisor to the French prime minister twice. And uh, Ambassador Ripper has just uh, published a book um, uh, uh, in French, uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, plural, uh, uh, the combat, um, uh, fighting diplomacy, um, uh, which I really recommend, which I read over the weekend, and uh, which is a very um, uh, well-written and uh, interesting uh, uh, book, which uh, you will see the, uh, the link uh, appearing uh, 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 later on uh, during the conversation of, uh, of, of Ambassador uh, Ripper's book. Um, uh, we have another ambassador uh, joining us, uh, Ambassador uh, Masa Fumi Ishii, uh, uh, who likes to be called um, uh, Masa, so I will call him Masa. Um, he was ambassador uh, of Japan uh, to uh, Indonesia, um, uh, among uh, many other roles. Um, he was also director general for global issues uh, in the in the Japanese uh, foreign ministry and legal advisor. Uh, but he was posted in, in in many places, including Washington, where he served twice, London, Belgium, and uh, 
and NATO uh, as 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 ambassador. Um, and he spent four years um, in, in Jakarta. And I think, you know, Indonesia is one of these countries where we want to to learn a lot about. And I can see uh, behind the ambassador a, a beautiful beach, uh, which is possibly uh, in Indonesia. Um, but uh, that will uh, make us dream for the next uh, two hours, uh, despite the fact we're going to talk about some not so amusing issues. Um, um, uh, next, we have uh, our host, uh, 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 Professor uh, Maila, who will speak uh, on the Middle East. Professor Maila uh, has been at ESSEC for uh, over a decade, but has had a very distinguished uh, career as a professor, scholar, um, uh, director of the uh, policy planning of the French Foreign Ministry, um, and a, a professor of political science in Beirut, um, in, in, in Paris, at the uh, Catholic um, Institute. And he's well known for his uh, wise advice uh, in the Middle East and, and in, the, in the Maghreb. And we're lucky to, to have him as the director of, uh, of the mediation uh, program at, at ESSEC. And, 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 and finally, uh, is our, our, our colleague, uh, uh, Frédéric uh, Charillon, Professor Charillon, who is a professor of political science uh, at ESSEC and also at the University uh, uh, Paris uh, Descartes. Uh, he has been teaching uh, international relations in, 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 in many places, including at the ENA, École Nationale d'Administration, and at the Institute of, of Political Science. Uh, he used to run the um, the Institute of Research of the French Military School, and, and he has published also a book called uh, Guerre d'Influence, uh, Wars of Influence, uh, that came out uh, a couple of years ago on, on, on the various ways uh, where nations and, and, and non-state actors are, are, are competing. Um, so um, they will come. Um, they will come in a few minutes. But first, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Paul Tucker, uh, who is our, our keynote speaker. Um, Paul Tucker is a former uh, colleague of mine at the at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School's uh, uh, Musawa Rahmani Center on Business and Government, and he serves as as a research uh, fellow there. Uh, but previously, as he alluded to, uh, he uh, worked as an economist uh, and a central banker, reaching the rank of deputy governor of the Bank of England between 2009 and 2013. And he was also a director of the Bank for International Settlements, where he ran uh, groups designing reforms of the international order. So he has a life experience and no doubt that he's years as a central banker gave him a full um, opening to the redefinition of the international order. From his distinguished career as a central banker, he published a comprehensive book called uh, uh, Unelected Power uh, in 2018, uh, which I recommend to everyone interested in, in, in global uh, finance especially. But today uh, we're talking about another book, uh, uh, Global Discord, um, um, a book uh, even more ambitious, uh, even more uh, uh, ambitious uh, proposition as Paul looks at um, the conceptions of legitimacy based on political uh, philosophers such as uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, David Hume and, and, and Bernard uh, Williams. Uh, it seems his favorite is actually Hume, if I'm not mistaken, a, a thinker who, who defined modern game theory. Um, how to adapt it to contemporary international relations is our, our question of the day, I guess, one of them anyway, that, uh, that Paul addresses in his book, uh, which is a lot about great power competition. Yes. And, uh, and for example, France and Great Britain in the 17th and 18th century um, but also uh, closer to my own interest, which is U.S.-China uh, rivalry. Um, by the way, uh, Paul's book. Uh, there's a link also uh, coming coming up in the in the chat about about Paul's book. If some of you are interested in in uh, ordering it, and what I like about the book, which is really uh, readable, 
uh, is the fact that it goes back to history, but also looks at practical ways to address uh, multilateralism and, and also offers some scenarios, uh, which I'm sure uh, uh, Paul will, will, will describe for us. So Paul, uh, please go ahead. Thanks for coming uh, to us from, uh, from Boston and uh, we're delighted to have you and, uh, and I look forward to, to, to hearing your, your, your presentation. Well, 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 Philippe, thank you very much. And thank you to you and, and Joseph and your team for including me in, in this. It's a, it's a kind of real treat, actually, to be involved in something that comes out of, of Paris and engaging with, with French thinkers and thinkers elsewhere in the, the world. We, we're, we're at an extraordinary um, moment, I think, in, in world history. Um, jo Joseph talked about the challenges to multilateral institutions. I mean, speaking in broad brushstrokes, my view is that the international regimes in which some of us have um, spent time since the Second World War and have framed the world, really, um, th these are regimes that have subsist under the umbrella of the security regime. Um, first of all, a kind of balance of power, and then secondly, Washington hegemony with Europe as a kind of close, supportive and critical partner. And we now live in a world where there is a new rise in power um, with different values that draws on China's own history and with India over perhaps the next hill as the next rise in power. And, and therefore it's almost inevitable that the terms of engagement through international regimes um, are going to change. And I want to say one concrete, give one concrete example and then broaden out a bit. The concrete example comes from the World Trade Organization, which certainly in economics is kind of the bedrock regime, first the GATT and then the WTO over the past 70 years. But just over a decade ago, there was a case where the United States, I think supported by Europe, but certainly the United States formally objected um, to Chinese export subsidies, which they were delivering through state-owned enterprises. And this went up to the appellate board in the WTO. And the appellate board found in favor of Beijing on the kind of rather peculiar grounds in a way that state-owned enterprises are not public bodies within the meaning of the, of the treaty. There's, there's a lot to be said about the detail of that, but the, the kind of more profound thing is that the people that had drawn up the WTO treaty didn't make any allowance for the possibility of a great power rising who would not subscribe to the same liberal trade values. And what's more, they had um, framed the WTO treaty in terms that make it quite incredibly difficult to amend because essentially everybody has a veto. So it wasn't as though Washington and Beijing um, with, with Tokyo and Brussels in the background could bargain their way out of, of this. Actually, they were stuck. And the response of the United States was exaggerating only slightly to walk out of the appellate um, body. And this was not an initiative of President Trump. It was an, a response from President um, Obama. And there's a sense in which, although it can do small things, the WTO is moribund and the action is in regional um, trade pacts of various um, kinds. Now, <clears throat> I think the contest between um, Washington and the European capitals and Tokyo and Seoul and others on the one hand and Beijing on the other is quite profound and quite, in, in, in modernity, quite novel in that it is everywhere and will be everywhere. It is in everything and it is ideological. And one of those features didn't, wasn't a characteristic of the old Cold War between the West and the Soviet Union, because quite not long after the end of the Second World War, um, Stalin walked the, the Soviet bloc out of the highways of the international economy. So although that struggle was, was everywhere, it was absolutely not in everything. Whereas the commercial entanglements of China and the rest of the world, including our world, 
are of course um, wide and and deep. Nor nor is it like um, the contest between let's say France and Britain on the one hand and the Second German Reich in the run up to the First World War because that was essentially about power and not so much about ideology. Whereas this is about um, the values of domestic governance and international governance. And anyone that, who doubts that should, should just Google document nine, um, which was, was either leaked or released from the central committee of the party in 2013, which sets out seven no's, basically instructing Chinese people not to engage with, let alone promote, um, liberal values that lie at the heart of our system of governance and run through the international regimes created in our, um, in our image. <clears throat> Philippe was kind enough to mention that the book has some scenarios. It essentially has four. One is new world order. For what it's worth, I don't think we can find our way to a new world order until the equilibrium balance of power is clear. And that will depend upon whether India does rise I think it's possible also that Indonesia um, will rise, which I don't just say because Ambassador Ishii is on the, on this um, conference. But there's a profound question about Europe as well. I mean, there's a lot of talk about Europe needing to, to kind of put more into defense. Something that doesn't feature in the discussion enough is that if Europe were to become a hard power again, and there are many steps to be taken before that would be feasible, but if it were to become a hard power again, that of course would change the world and the dynamic between the key European capitals and, and Washington. Another scenario is lingering status quo. And this is not to be neglected, not least because in, in the monetary sphere, um, the role of the dollar has kind of inertial power that could mean that, that kind of underpins the US security role in the world and could do so for some time. But essentially, I think we're going to live between the, um, two other scenarios, superpower struggle and new Cold War. And we could easily find ourselves drifting into a new Cold War. And in some respects, <clears throat> we see that already if one thinks about um, the Ukraine war as a kind of proxy war insofar as it would have been hard for Putin to prosecute it in the way he has without um, Beijing's acquiescence. I, I want to make one other set of remarks to close, Philippe, if I may. So what does this mean for policy in, in, for the West? And again, I'm going to um, paint in broad brushstrokes. First of all, I think in terms of our basic objective, it should be to hold on to our way of life, our liberal way of life. And by that, I do not mean imposing it on the rest of the world, but I think it should mean that whatever international, new international order we can go along with, it should be one, whether one is sitting in Tokyo or Seoul or Paris or Berlin, Brussels, Washington, or dare I say even London, that the kind of institutions we have for governance and the way they fit with our own histories should be something that we regard as precious and to be held on to. So where I come from is, is realist, um, but not without morality, if you like. It's not a kind of completely cynical um, realism, but it's certainly not idealistic. In policy terms, I think it, it kind of means things that sound banal but aren't. <clears throat> we should avoid um, unnecessary vulnerabilities to Beijing. I, I started saying that about a decade ago. I guess it's now a, a commonplace in de-risking. De-risking, of course, could spill over into protectionism and so needs to be judicious. But we need to be realistic about where our vulnerabilities are. Secondly, um, we, the, the kind of liberal world or liberal democratic world, the West isn't the right word for that. We need, we need to make sure that we maintain friends around the whole world. Um, the, the language of the pivot um, from Washington some time ago it was unfortunate as a metaphor. A pivot moves towards something, but it moves away from something, leaving people in Central Asia and the Middle East, and even in parts of Europe, wondering whether the United States cared less about those parts of the world. And the, as France knows from its own history, and Britain, I'm afraid, knows from its own history, that if you are the hegemon, 
you actually have to be interested in everywhere all of the time and you can't kind of ignore parts of the world and the, the third thing is we we need to avoid, avoid self-inflicted mistakes policy um, mistakes and if i can call on kind of one aspect of my previous existence as a central banker we absolutely can't afford another financial crisis and yet only a decade after the last one um, in 2023, we had a banking crisis in the United States. We had a banking crisis that was potentially gigantic in Switzerland. Both of those could easily be have been avoided. And it shows, reveals to me, not a point about banking, but that we are still careless about things that can damage our position in the world in this contest that I think will continue for decades and decades, possibly for a century, and Philip you, mentioned, Philip, you mentioned this. I think that there's a lot to be learned from the struggle between my own country, Britain, and France in the long 18th century, a century from 1689 to 1815. This was, this was a period where there were lulls and rapprochements. There was a trade treaty sometime in the middle of the 18th century, and it kind of never came to fruition. Instead, we had another war. Um, and, we, and that didn't really come to an end until the 1860s, when finally, there were treaties in which um, the Third Republic and, and a parliamentary Britain actually shared sufficient views and accommodations to kind of reshape the world. And it was at that point, by the way, that world growth took off. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, if, I, if I can follow up with a... With a couple of questions, uh, perhaps, uh, or, or, or comments. I mean, um, you you mentioned uh, the, 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 the most probable scenario to be the new Cold War, but many people have, have sort of uh, criticized the, 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 this term of Cold War in the current context for the good reason that you actually point out in your own book that, that China is more or less everywhere. The competition is everywhere. And, 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 and the Chinese economy is not to be uh, to be isolated for, for the rest of the world, which is why no nobody uses the, uh, the the wording decoupling anymore. I mean, not, not, not many reasonable people, as far as I can tell, but uh, even the word de-risking is actually being criticized in China. And obviously, China doesn't like to be uh, accused and to be ostracized. Um, but um, I mean, if we are facing a, a, a sort of Cold War, uh, how do you see it? What 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 does it mean? And also, um, uh, the uh, I mean, you mentioned the global South. Uh, perhaps we should just say the South. Uh, and I'd love to hear uh, 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 Ambassador Ishii's comments on this uh, later on. Um, you know, are there several South? Is just is there just one West? I mean, these these, these geographical assertions how how meaningful are they today? especially with India rising, with uh, uh, China and Russia uh, uh, being very close partners. Uh, and is Japan part of the West? I mean, this is something that I want to hear about from our friend from Tokyo later on. But, but Paul, if you have a few, a few comments before we, we, we move on to the, to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. I, I would say on this, I think the new Cold War is something we could fall into. I don't think it's something we should set out to achieve, but the a, a policy of de-risking um, to the extent that it has to work through parliaments and the United States through Congress, it kind of almost inevitably carries the risk of being taken too far. Um, and a, a possible example, I don't say it is a good example, but a possible example is the current US administration's stance on China buying various steel um, um, businesses in the United States. You know, is that the other side of the line or, or, or not? It, I mean, Apple has a huge, huge, huge factory, city-sized factory in China. If that were to be closed down in the context of a conflict, is that inconvenient or is that actually strategic? And I think if one were kind of around the White House under any administration, one would want to go through almost everything um, with a provisional view on whether it was strategic or not, which actually means, would this impair our capacity um, in the unlikely event of a conflict um, to come out on the right side of that conflict? 
On, on the global south, um, I, I, I think that we at least in the rich north, as it were, should not use that word terribly much. I think it's fantastically patronizing because it puts everybody else in the same in the same bucket rather than recognizing different parts of the world and different states in certain parts of the world have distinct histories, distinct values, um, distinct um, capabilities. I mean, within um, the less rich world, of course, it will be the interests of some potential leaders to, to kind of try and group everybody together in the global south, just as they did around Bandung um, and after. That doesn't mean it's in everybody's interests. I want to say one thing in closure about India. Um, for me, the most important thing that happened in 2020 was not COVID. And I don't mean that lightly, because I had COVID pretty badly myself, actually, although obviously not fatally. And, and, but many people um, did have um, COVID fatally, and that's appalling. But I think the most important thing in history was the border skirmish between China and, and India. And it was one of those um, extraordinary moments where the response of Delhi was, you know, that quad idea um, the Prime, Prime Minister Abe had promoted in his first term of Prime Minister that we, Delhi, thought was a bad idea. Oh, actually, it turns out to be a good idea. Um, and it was revived. And on the whole, no one should spend their time reading the communiques of summit gatherings. But actually, the communique from the Quad Summit earlier this year, no, earlier last, 2023, is worth reading. Um, just for the scale and depth of the working parties that they have set up. And it's not so much the substance that matters, but the connections between those capitals, Tokyo, Canberra, um, Washington, and Delhi. And I, I, think that's a, um, I think that's a good thing. And it doesn't mean that India is kind of in some juvenile sense on our side. It's on its own side, but India is showing itself to be a country that, um, that we can work with on various fronts. And I think that is of profound um, importance. Thanks very much, Paul. That was, that, that was, that was great, very useful. Um, and let me, let me tell uh, uh, the audience that they, they are more than welcome to, to send questions during, the, during this conversation. Uh, they can send it online mm -hmm. and I will probably read them uh, so that we don't, uh, we don't have too many voices that would make uh, the, uh, the 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 dialogue between us a little bit um, uh, complicated, but 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 by all means, be, do send your 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 questions, and we will uh, we will discuss them uh, as much as possible. Uh, let me now turn to uh, 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 Jean Maurice Ripper, uh, who has uh, uh, has had this uh, uh, amazing, uh, distinguished career, and um, who is also a um, a player in the in the the word of non-state actors these days, I, as I understand, and um, I'd like to hear perhaps both uh, from your experience uh, on, on as as ambassador to the United Nations, because one one big problem we we all seeing today is really the uh, the the inefficiency or the dysfunctionality perhaps of the United Nations uh, system. Uh, today and and also uh, perhaps uh, drawing from your experience as ambassador to to Russia then China uh, how much these two powers uh, uh, which are um, uh, connected very closely as 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 Joseph mentioned at the beginning of of, of this uh, talk um, um, how much do they actually prevent the Security Council uh, and the international order, which was created, uh, of course, after a World War II, to, to work properly. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, many resolutions have been blocked over the years, not just recently, but also if you think of Syria, if you think of, of other crises, which you you describe uh, in, in, your, in your own book. Uh, uh, very often, Russia has been supported by China, who tends to stay on the side. Uh, although now, of course, when it comes to the Korean Peninsula or some other issues where it's more directly involved, perhaps uh, it is uh, now prepared to block uh, resolutions more directly. But anyway, the, the floor is yours, Ambassador. 
Thank you, Philippe, and uh, thank you to Aurelia and, of course, the SEC and, and Joseph to, to have invited me. It's, it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, I will focus on the UN because I have 30 years of experience in the UN and global affairs. Uh, but first, uh, I agree with Joseph. Uh, the UN are not inefficient. The difficulties of the Security Council should not hide the fact that all over the planet, the only center of legitimacy to act, uh, think of WHO, uh, UNICEF, uh, all those agencies of the UN are present all over the world with incredibly devoted and brave people fighting for the freedom, dignity, and health care and, and of, of, of millions of people. So first of all, let's not confuse everything. When we are talking about geostrategy, perhaps the UN has not delivered. I'm not so sure. We have to remind what the UN were built for. It was the organization of the countries which had won the Second World War. It was built to avoid a major new conflict between the superpowers. In this respect, it has succeeded. First thing. Second one, uh, I, I will come back to that. I don't think, I don't believe, and I, I will surprise you in many of my remarks, but you know me, Philippe. I don't think for a minute that on the long term, Russia and China have common interests. They are fighting, they are competing. Yeah, yeah. To go back to the very nice Cold War status where two countries were ruling the world. The only question remaining, who will be the second one? By the, by the side of the Americans. And there, of course, Russia and China are competing each against each other. Let me go back to the UN and first a uh, very quick assessment of what is going on. Uh, first of all, in this very difficult period, I would uh, remind you that the first threat to humanity is the global warming and the disappearance of biodiversity. 50% of biodiversity has disappeared in China during the last 30 years. It's a disaster, not only in China, of course, it's an example. But the whole planet is not aware of the fact that this is a global threat to the global humanity. If only that would be the first reason for which multilateralism should not disappear. I could talk about the remaining impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic because in the South, the consequences are still there. Less capacity in terms of health, less capacity to raise money. Let's talk about the forgotten conflicts everywhere. DRC, Burma, Yemen, Libya, foreign and regional interference. And I guess perhaps uh, our friend um, Frédéric will, will talk about that. Um, war is again raging in Europe. Two hours of plane from Paris. And London, by the way, this is something which we thought was not possible anymore. The Middle East, Joseph will talk about it. What is happening in Gaza is again threatening the whole humanity. Terrorism is still there. The rise of, you, uh, Sir Paul mentioned it, the rise of nationalistic, xenophobic, authoritarian regime, denying, including in Europe, basic rights and law to their own citizens. Two unfavorable developments uh, of, of this uh, context. The call into question of the benefits of democracy and of uh, globalization. And second one, of course, uh, the uh, call into question of the marginal system centered on the UN. Let's not forget also other elements of background. The first victims of all of the above are always civilian populations, especially women and children. For the first time in 2022, the mark of 100 million refugees has been, or displaced people have, has been reached. The, the situation of children is terrible everywhere in the world. And you mentioned, uh, Philippe, my, 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 my work today, I'm chairing two NGOs, including one dealing with uh, the rights of children and the fight against violence against women and 
girls. This is terrible the situation of those people. And we should never forget what we are talking about. We are talking about geopolitics among states, but it's about human beings. It's for them that we should be fighting for a new world order. Uh, against this backdrop, I think, and I will surprise you there, I guess, that several developments are uh, of, of, of the greatest importance. First, I mentioned it, the structure of multilateralism are still there, but we are facing today countries which are questioning openly the legitimacy of the multilateral system. This is the case of China, of course, and uh, it was not the case of Russia, but now Russia has to buy the support of China and is on this side of the road. They want some U United Nations as weak as possible. There is another difference, but the other way around, Russia wants the disappearance of the European Union, probably not China. The second thing, which in my view is very important, people often say there are no more rules. It's not true. There are rules, still. All the convention, the, inter uh, the international convention, the charter of the UN, the international declaration on human rights, hundreds of convention under the UN, the international uh, criminal court. But the people, once again, some people want to uh, deny their legitimacy and they say clearly they don't want to abide by those rules. In this respect, some Im important issues to me are like that contrary to what a lot of people think, I think that there is a relative withdrawal of the three major superpowers. None of the major superpowers can today impose alone their will, including sometimes on their allies. Look at the Americans fighting, bickering with the Europeans, or the, the Americans not able to impose to Israel, and Joseph will talk about that, a truth in a conflict. Let's look at, at the Russians. They are questioned even in their own former empire that they pretend they want to recreate. If you speak with people in Georgia, in Moldova, in, 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 in Armenia, in Kazakhstan, they don't want the rule of Putin. So in my view, Russia is in the same side of the coin, not to talk about the um, almost complete disintegration of the Russian economy, except for energy and, and, and a few, I mean, they are not able even to win a war anymore. This is for, in a way frightening, but in my view, this is very positive, of course. And China, you can see it, elections when they took place in Hong Kong, election in Taiwan a few uh, weeks ago, when the Chinese have the right to vote, they vote against Xi Jinping. And look at what is happening in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Singapore. Probably uh, Ambassador Ishii will talk about it. They are que questioning about the, the, the way China tried to impose its new hegemonism throughout Indo-Pacific region. Confronting that, uh, a second idea that I have is that I don't believe, I'm sorry, to this notion of global south, which in my view has been invented by China. You remember, they were talking about the G77 and China, as if China was the natural leader of the South. This is not true anymore. Look at what happened when they tried to enlarge the BRICS. Argentina said, no, sorry, I'm not interested. Try to get some political sense within the BRICS between India and China. Look at what happened to the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization as soon as they had India and, and Pakistan at the same time, and then Iran. It was impossible to get any kind of consensus on political issues. So the BRICS, the, the, um, OI, the OSC will remain economic cooperation organization. This is already very nice. The question is also that we should not talk anymore about uh, emerging countries, because countries and powers have emerged. It's obvious today that Brazil, Argentina, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, South Africa, Kenya, Senegal, Brazil, all of them want to be part of the discussions and negotiations all over the planet. They have things to say. They want to be part of the decision-making process. 
But what is interesting is that they don't want to be any more part of any kind of alliance. So in my idea, uh, the future will be made of something which I call in French, I, I'm sorry for my English, un monde de sous-ensemble flou. So I looked into tra translation and see something like a world made of fuzzy sets. Does it make sense in English? So the, the, the partnership agreements among those new powers will change. They will adapt in their themes, in their temporality, and in their geography. China will um, cooperate with India on one subject, and they will cooperate with the US on another one. Nobody wants to be part of any alliance anymore. The only alliance that remains is a military one. It's NATO. But it doesn't answer the question. Last but not least, the emergence of European Union as a new center of power. So Paul talked about it. It's not yet a hard power, but it's doing its best to become a hard power. Today, the European Union is 50, million people, uh, 500 million people. It's three times more than Russia. It's never forget that the first economic and trade partner of Russia, well, before the war at least, of the US and of China at the same time. It provides more than 50% of the official development assistance throughout the world and humanitarian assistance. It has agreements all over the planet with many, 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 many countries on all continents. It's a peaceful, non-hegemonic, imperialistic power. So. Europe has a chance if they can build this, this um, uh, what they call the strategic autonomy, politically, militarily, technologically, health, uh, food, energy, and everything. This is a ma major change because there is it's no more a question of, of a triangle. It's a question of a quadrilateral. I don't know how you say that in English. I'm sorry. I think there are four powers which are more strong, stronger than the other ones, but they will have to deal with all the other ones. And in my view, the natural partner of those uh, already emerged countries in the South is the European Union. In face of that, we need more multilateralism, of course, to try to put a little a sense of, of rationality where we can. <clears throat> and of course, the answer is the UN. There is no other choice because there is no other structure. It has to change, it has to reform, it has to be more efficient, less costly, blah, 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 all of the above. But first, I've been under Secretary General of the UN for humanitarian assistance. When I was calling in front of an emergency for, for funding from the member states, I, you got a third of what you need. And then everybody's blaming the UN for not being efficient the member states of the UN should go back to the UN. They have left the UN. This is not the way it should work. Last but not least, sorry, Philippe, I, I will stop there, but let me answer your last questions. Of course, the UN are in danger today because as I mentioned, the remaining three superpowers, what remains of the three major powers, superpowers, are in a way converging in weakening the organizations. We have seen with Trump, we have seen with the American administration going in, going out, and in, in again and out again, cutting financing, giving back finance. Today, Israel left the, uh, recalled its ambassador to, uh, to the UN. I'm not sure it pleased the Americans, but I mean, the Americans have to reinvest in the UN if they want their partners to continue to work with them and follow them. In front of that, China has openly, publicly, constantly since 2013, it was mentioned, proclaimed two way of, of breaking with the international order. The first one, by denying any value to the human rights laws that were proclaimed by the United Nations, saying we only will abide with the droit characteristic Chinoise, Chinese law, whatever that means for those who have lived in China, you can guess what it means. I don't know if it's a, uh, something that they want the world to, to, to ad adopt. I have some doubts that everybody wants uh, to, to, to live under Chinese law. Look at what happened once again in Hong Kong and, and Taiwan. And then they want to break with the multilateral system. 
uh, Belt and Road Initiative is not an initiative. It's a creation of centered organizations, all centered and ruled by China, competing with the UN. The money is not going to the UN anymore. It's going to the uh, organizations under the umbrella of the Belt and Road Initiative. The objective of China is clear. The world has to be something like a bicycle. And one of the uh, wheel of the bicycle has to be centered on China. This is very clear. In front of that, we have to remain, as Sir Paul said, we have to remain strong on our values because dictatorship, they don't respect powers which are not respecting their own values. And we have to be clear on what we want and what we don't want. And the only solution for the whole world is and will remain, in my view, the UN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Maurice. Very, very strong words. And uh, there's a glimpse of hope about, about the UN if if the if the powers agree to to uh, make it work, which at the moment uh, oh. they don't. Uh, and and as you said, there are counter powers to the to the US or counter organizations that are put in place by uh, um, authoritarian uh, states, mainly alternatives to, to the UN order with all kinds of organizations which will address. But let's hear the, the, the voice of Japan uh, through uh, Ambassador Ishii. Welcome, Ambassador. Welcome, Maza. Uh, very, you, glad to, very glad to have you uh, from Tokyo. Uh, and uh, you, you have a very diverse career. And obviously, uh, you can speak both about Japan as a member of the G7 and multilateralism, which is a very important component of Japan's foreign diplomacy these days. Uh, all the way back to uh, Prime Minister Abe, but uh, till now. Uh, but you can also give us some mm -hmm. views on the on on the what how the Asians, uh, especially the Southeast Asians, you know well, um, see uh, uh, today's uh, um, international situation. So I, I understand you have some slides to 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 show us. And uh, yes, I do. Yes, I you do. Can go ahead uh, any time. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Philip, for having me from the other side of the world. And uh, thank you for wise and philosophical remarks of uh, uh, Joseph and Paul and uh, Ambassador Rippert. I, my remarks will be, uh, will be, won't be as deep as theirs, won't be as philosophical as theirs. But uh, I try to give you how we see the world from this part of the world. And uh, what are the practical things we are supposed to do? Now, <laughs> new competition in multilateralism. First, uh, let me describe where we are as, as the first background. I think at this time, rule of the game is to create majority in international scene. And uh, we do have a clear advantage over Russia and China, which is uh, if the United States tries, that is a problem. But if you say US tries, they are more meaningful friends to follow, as, as Ambassador Rippert said. So this is the worst time for uh, such a person like uh, Trump 2.0 to lead the United States, in my view. I'll talk about it later. Then uh, second thing is uh, we are in the era of what I call challenge sharing. It used to be, I think we know the word of burden sharing, right? <laughs> Burden sharing was okay. And uh, at that time, I think the United States was was still able to handle the challenges all by itself while hoping uh, that allies and like-minded countries can share some of the burdens for handling challenges in, in the form of a cost. That's, that's in my mind, uh, I think, uh, burden sharing. But although I think the United States is still the only superpower in the world, I think its GDP is 1.5 larger than Chinese, it, uh, its uh, defense spending is 2.5 times larger than Chinese. So I think it is still the only superpower, but um, I think its will, readiness to take up challenges by itself has been significantly weakened much earlier than we expected. 
So after all, it's been 10 years since uh, since President Obama said the U.S. should not continue to act like the policeman for the whole world. It's been 10 years. And the U.S. is now deeply divided, even in terms of its readiness to engage in global crisis. I think it's just 50 50 percent. And uh, I think uh, there was U.S. was not uh, directly involved in the Ukraine war. And uh, President Biden said even even before it started. And I think President Biden also excluded Iran from a target for revenge before revenging uh, in, in response to the uh, killing of uh, two U.S. soldiers in uh, in Syria, I mean, in Jordan. Right? So where we are now is uh, what I call new era of challenge sharing. I think the United States is no longer willing to take up the challenges by itself. And we'd like to see allies to share responsibilities for handling challenges while sharing burden is taken for granted. So I think no one country is ready to take responsibility of ending the war in Ukraine. And allies and like-minded countries need to bear some responsibilities for doing such things. And uh, we are, I think we are still in, uh, in somehow in, well, we, we haven't realized that the era has changed and that we need to bear responsibility for taking up challenges by ourselves, while the US is receding much, much faster than we thought. So there's a big vacuum. The third element, in, if I, I may, this, this is a little bit, uh, I think, uh, controversial perhaps, but uh, we need to depart from sanction regime, which is a negative linkage. If you do something wrong, you are punished. And to move to reward regime, that's a positive linkage. If you do something good, you are rewarded. I think uh, in order to make more friends to create majority, reward regime makes much more sense in my mind. And sanction regime has become increasingly divisive. Thus, I think it has become least effective anyway. That's the first background. Eh? Then let me tell you where are we heading in my mind. What will happen in 20 years? I think the US, uh, as I said, US is still the only superpower now. I think around that before 2030, 2040, I think we will see three superpowers, United States, China, and India. I think India's future is still controversial, but um, I think sometime in the late 90, 2030s, although the slowing down of a Chinese economy is very deep, I think at the end of the day, China's GDP will become more or less as large as the United States, and uh, it takes more time for its uh, defense spending will become as, as much as the United States. And uh, so it does look like a G2, which means the world is governed by United States and China. But as you know, India's, India's population has become world number one last year. And then the aging in India will start only after 2040s. And I think India's GDP will overtake Japan's as early as next year. So that's where we are. Uh, three superpowers coexisting and the interaction of these three superpowers will decide the more or less the basic direction of the global, global issues. Now, the second trend in, in the 20 years, as you say, Indonesia and India will be decisive for creating majority. It seems uh, Indonesia's GDP will overtake Japan sometime late uh, 2040s if the present uh, pace of uh, growth continues. So if we try to create new G7 in uh, sometime in 2040, who will be in? I think there'll be G3, China, J China, US, and India, and plus Japan and Indonesia, world number four, number five, or number six of GDP. And I'm sure Europe will stay, EU will stay, if it stays united, I'm sure it will stay united. And uh, I'm afraid Russia will be there as well as a negative power depending heavily on the existing privileges it has, like a huge number of nuclear weapons, uh, veto power in the Security Council. So if something like uh, Ukraine happens at that time, what will happen? I think uh, more or less uh, what is going to happen then will be more or less what is happening now after the Ukraine, Ukraine war started. You see the US, Japan, and Europe on the one side, and China and Russia, although I agree with Ambassador Rippert that they don't see eye to eye to each other, they are rivals. 
there are two major two superpowers uh, facing over border, so they, their relation cannot be cannot be good. So, but uh, relatively speaking, their position will be at the, the other end of the spectrum. So the question is, who are left in between? I think India and Indonesia. These two big guys, as Ambassador Rippers was saying, will never make an uh, alliance. I think they will always make their decision based upon a very frank expression of their national interest. So the the so which which side, U.S. side or China side? These two big guys are an inch closer to will decide the majority of the world. So it's our task to do whatever it takes to keep them a little bit closer to our side by making a lot of efforts during peacetime. That's that's my second. <clears throat> the third uh, trend, if I may, relates to the South uh, East Asia. I think they always say, don't force us to choose, but I think they have already made their mind uh, in, well, they have already chosen in their mind, I think. Japanese Foreign Ministry has been carrying out uh, opinion poll uh, in those uh, ASEAN countries uh, every two years. And the consistent uh, questions have been, which country are you going to rely on more or which country are you going to trust more in future? And then those countries who say Japan more than China are only three. After all these uh, supply of ODA and everything, I think uh, there are only three countries among us and countries who uh, choose Japan over China for the future partner. These are big three I, I call, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, all of which is, has uh, more than 100 million population now. So they are big enough to be ready to rely on uh, Japan and United States at the time of crisis, which is normally caused by their big neighbor in the North. Then comes the middle three, uh, countries with uh, medium-sized population, Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar. These are very important countries, but I, the opinion polls does show a swing between China and uh, Japan, uh, according to different administrations. So they are important, but uh, we need to understand they are not with us all the time. Now comes small three, Cambodia, Lao Republic, and Brunei. I think uh, considering their size, their economic relations, and so on and so forth, I think we need to control our expectation at the time, well, as to what they can do at the time of crisis. There's one uh, exception, of course, that is Singapore. I think if you ask the question, which, which country are you going to rely on more in future? I think 95% of them say, of course, China. But uh, as you know, they host the US Navy and Air Force since 1990s after they decided to leave uh, the Philippines. So, and then uh, you, you know the, the where their military forces are doing the training is uh, Taiwan. And the place uh, the, the former prime ministers of Singapore have played uh, golf most of the time is Taiwan. So I think uh, they are allowed to bet on both sides, China and the United States and Taiwan and mainland China. So I think in my mind, uh, the, the, the Southeast Asian countries, 10 ASEAN countries are already divided into these four different groups. Now Global South, I know Ambassador Ripa didn't like Global South and uh, I don't think uh, there is, uh, I mean, there is uh, there's no country called Global South. There's no group of countries who have the same view or positioning. I think during the Cold War, it was easy there are only two choices, the United States or, or Russia, I mean, Soviet Union. But now there are many countries, uh, these uh, global South countries need to, need to bear in mind, they bear their positions in mind. China is there, US is there, India is there, European Union is there, Russia is still there. So I think each one of them does a very careful uh, positioning effort corresponding to their relation with each one of these different uh, poles, different big countries. So I, I, it, it's natural to say that uh, there is no bunch of uh, group of countries who have the same national interest or same position in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, these different uh, countries, big, big guys. So in that, in that regard, so engaging the what does uh, engaging Global South mean? 
I think you need to, we need to do, a, well, as I said, the first uh, in, in the outset that the rule of the game now is to create majority. So what we need to do is uh, make, make a, a relation to each one of the influential global South countries, South global South countries closer to create majority. So for that purpose, first we need to use a tailored approach. I think reflecting the strategic positioning of each global South country, we do need to use a tailored approach. <laughs> and then of course we need to prioritize which are the important countries, important target for, for uh, approach and then concentrate on them. Identify strong and influential countries among global South and prioritize the, it in strengthening our relation and uh, I think uh, example of, uh, you know, the when BRICS expanded its, uh, its uh, membership, I think uh, there are countries BRICS decided not to include, like Indonesia, uh, like, uh, like uh, Nigeria. So I think we need to uh, take into account uh, how they feel at this time being ignored by the BRICS. And last but not least, uh, we are, we have many friends meaning friends, powerful friends. So we need to coordinate and divide our labors, uh, divide our responsibilities. Now, how to coordinate and divide labor? Uh, we should first coordinate as not possible uh, views about the following among like-minded countries, among the, maybe in G7, who are our priority partners, what we need from each one of them, and what we should do now to achieve that end. So, and uh, I think there, there can be a certain uh, regional division of labor. And uh, I'm sure uh, Southeast Asia, Japan can do a lot with the help of uh, Australia, Central Asia, through the participation in Shanghai Cooperation, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think India has a very close tie with South Central Asian countries now, and Japan can help as well. South Pacific, I'm sure Australia, Australia can do a little bit more. And uh, importantly, Africa and Middle East, I think Europe should do more. And, uh, you know, if uh, Middle East becomes uh, very uh, unstable, uh, the flow of uh, terrorism, pro flow of uh, immigration will hurt Europe, as you, we all know. So I think uh, particularly Africa, I, I think... Uh, this is not the time for us to see the last soldier, last French soldier leaving uh, the, the Sahel. I think we need, we, it's a, it's a part of, I think, uh, European Union's strategic autonomy to do a little bit more for the stabilization of Africa. Otherwise you see more infiltration of uh, things like uh, Wagner and China. And uh, I'm not saying US is doing a great job in its backyard either. I think Latin America is in a disarray and the United States should have done much, much, much better job, I think. Now, this is, uh, I, I know my 10 minutes have already passed, but uh, this is actually the, shows the spread of a global South countries in terms of GDP and population. Each column represents each uh, region and uh, those countries listed on the left-hand side has a population more than, uh, Five, uh, 50 million. The right hand side, less than 50 million. So if, if you go through this and then uh, bear in mind uh, which countries decided to join BRICS, it's very interesting because Latin America, although Argentina finally said no, why not Mexico? I think Mexico has much larger GDP than Argentina, much larger population than Argentina. And uh, Middle East, they chose Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Iran. Why not Turkey? In Africa, they chose, uh, I think, uh, Egypt and Ethiopia. I do understand the reason why they chose these two countries, but uh, why not Nigeria? I think Nigeria, Nigeria, after all, has the largest population in Africa, largest GDP in Africa. So I think uh, this is one example. We need to concentrate on those countries which uh, BRICS, at the end of the day, decided not to include in the first round. I'm sure the Nigeria's pride, for example, is a little bit hurt by that choice. So this is time to talk to Nigerians, time to talk to Turkey, although it's difficult, time to engage Mexico more 
and time to engage Indonesia, which decided to walk away from uh, BRICS instead of uh, joining, instead uh, it decided to join OECD. Now, can I speak uh, two or three more minutes? Okay. Um, I think uh, every panelist uh, so far has been really decent without talking about Trump 2.0, but uh, I, I just want to describe to you the real difficulty the Asia will face after Trump 2.0 comes in, if, if it becomes a reality. Although it's not decided yet, there are, there are many still many hurdles to, to clear, but uh, I think there is a certain possibility and uh, it becomes much clearer after 5th of, 5th of March. So what does our experience of uh, Trump 1.0 tell us? Although he would like to make US military strong, military the strongest in the world, he is extremely careful in using US troops abroad. So I, I think, uh, anyway. And then he, the, the, it's a poor Taiwan. I think he's indifferent to Taiwan. I think his, uh, his uh, advisors in the Trump 1.0 clearly showed that, that, that clearly told in their, tell, the, tell us in, in their memoir that uh, Trump uh, 1.0 didn't show any interest in Taiwan at all. And uh, although he will be very tough on China, he may not understand the importance of fighting for the defense of Taiwan against China, which means uh, loss of a lot of US soldiers. And uh, though at this time, my view is neither China nor Taiwan or the United States, nobody would like to have military confrontation over Taiwan. But uh, there are two cases where China is like to to start it or forced to start it. First case, when Taiwan declares independence, which is clear, right? So that's why that is unlikely to happen. Second case, if it becomes quite clear that the United States do not intend to defend Taiwan at the time of a crisis, I think temptation on the part of China is too big to resist. And the Trump may even unconsciously make this second case happen. That's what we are afraid most. So, principle behind his action, I think uh, we nowadays in this part of the world, we are saying uh, not MAGA, make America great again, but uh, M2GA, that is make me great again. I think that has been the, the, the principle of his, uh, his, uh, his uh, action. So to convince him, you need to tell him that this is good for him. We are doing this for you. You are the reason why we are doing this good thing for you. That's what I think, uh, Prime Minister Abe was very good at saying. And the second, but second the tr uh, thing we need to understand is he's a guy to ride on the tide. Never go against the tide because he has no strong uh, belief or principle to do so. Well, I think his only strong belief is, uh, is uh, uh, extremely careful not to use uh, US troops uh, abroad. So, um, I think uh, for Ukraine, this means the end of US assistance, as we all know. And uh, he was in, in, uh, in the first administration, he was once about to withdraw United States force in, on Korea. And uh, 2.0 is, as we all, we all know, all for revenge. So he may try to do it again. If uh, USFK has to go, I think uh, USFJ, US force in Japan will have to go as well. So what, what's going to happen, the worst case scenario is when Taiwan is in trouble, the US, Japan, US, Korea alliances are in a deep trouble. So what should we do? I, I, there aren't so many things we can do, but uh, I think uh, knowing that he's a guy to ride on the tide, I think uh, if we are able to create wind or tide justifying NATO and the defense of Taiwan, and that the Japan-US, US-Korea alliance are crucial for that. Um, I think we may still uh, induce Trump to do things in line with that kind of a basic wind. And uh, in this part of the world, we are talking about the joint legal influence uh, operation and, uh, in the United States we may try to uh, organize a kind of a focus in the Congress together with Taiwan, which has the largest influence on US Congress, only next to, I think, Israel. 
and the Philippines and Australia. It's, it's an Indo-Pacific caucus, uh, recruiting uh, all the people who have uh, uh, power and readiness to talk to President Trump about the importance of uh, alliance and the importance of defending, uh, uh, the, uh, defending Taiwan. Last but not least, I think we should be really careful about the increasing in, increase of host nation support or the defense spending, since it may work counterproductively. If you increase your defense spend efforts and host nation support, I'm sure the all the NATO countries will try to do it in Europe, which is good by itself. That may make Trump believe that uh, we we or NATO countries can do it by ourselves. So why do we have to? Why does uh, Trump have to uh, send uh, U.S. troops? So th I think that he feels less need for the maintenance of alliance. So we have to be really careful about uh, increasing the host nation support. Sorry about all these uh, junk and practical things, but uh, this is the end of my remark. Too long. Sorry. No, no, that was great, uh, Maza. Thank you so much and uh, so much content. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll just... Uh, take it back that um, uh, neither uh, the current U.S. administration nor the uh, potential uh, uh, Trump administration, point, point two zero, as you said, uh, is willing to send troops uh, and to engage Americans uh, abroad, which is leading um, us in Europe particularly, but you in Asia too, to redefine our uh, relationship to uh, uh, war and peace, if I may say, and, and to international relations and to the international order, which is really, uh, we are the tipping point, really, every expert uh, on earth has been saying that, um, that, uh, you know, the Europeans, uh, you know, also needs to uh, put their act together. And, and, and you mentioned uh, strategic autonomy, and I, I hope uh, my colleague Frederick will uh, speak on that later, and, and the role that Europe um, could have, and at least in looking at its own affairs, which it has not always been the case. But also in Asia, uh, you mentioned uh, very interesting roles uh, for uh, for India, for Indonesia, for even for Vietnam, which, by the way, is also run by a communist party. Uh, so the, the the relationship between uh, China and Vietnam is, uh, is 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 quite complex, but. Definitely, uh, we are watching um, uh, with our own eyes. Uh, a redistribution of, of, of powers. Let me switch back to um, Joseph and to uh, the Middle East and, and um, you know, this big power competition that is now the, the moving itself onto this, this very troubled region, particularly the Gaza band, and, and especially since uh, the attack by Hamas, uh, um, uh, of October uh, the seventh, um, Joseph, uh, would you like to come in, please? Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, I would like uh, to congratulate uh, Ambassador Ishi for his comprehensive uh, presentation. He has broadened the scope, and we we were in a bad need of really going outside the United States, outside Europe, and look at the the broader world. Um, while listening to our distinguished uh, panelists, I have changed my presentation, and I'm going to make five comments or five points uh, challenging the things that have been said, uh, but um, I'm going to maybe from time to time to swim against the tide, Ambassador Ishii, and try to focus on things that are uh, of a very... Um, that are very illustrative of what we are heading for while uh, examining the issue of Gaza. Um, of course, we are in a situation that has been depicted by uh, Jean-Maurice uh, saying that the world today in terms of, I mean, not speaking about the big, the great powers, but about people in a horrendous situation in which we have this horrible attack by Hamas on the 7th of October. Uh, being followed by this carpet bombing uh, by the Israeli army. And people are not very much aware about the amount of people that are dying every day. I I'm sure they are aware. I'm sure a lot of people are aware, and especially the human 
um, the the organization that are dealing with human rights and uh, health uh, and children care, they are very much aware of that. But the incapacity of the international system to react is something which is frightening. Coming after the butchery that was uh, that represent the invasion by Russia of the uh, uh, of Ukraine. But let me tell you this: it may be well, it may well be sorry that the um, war in, in in the Gaza Strip could be a ve very illustrative of the disrupted international political system, and many fetch features could point out to, to that. First of all. Uh, my first point is that at the level of the United Nations Security Council, the vetoes have been posed against any call for a, a ceasefire, cessation of the fire in the Gaza Strip. By three times, if, I, if my memory, uh, if I'm, yes, the United States has opposed their veto to that. I don't. I won't focus on the United States because when it comes also to the ca the case of Ukraine, but Philippe will, uh, Frederic will speak on that. It was the same, and the incapacity of the United Nations Security Council to deal with Ukraine, with Gaza, after not dealing with Crimea, with uh, Georgia, with Abkhazia, is something which is frightening. So there is what I would call a veto trend, which is of course, related to the rivalry and the absence of a common ground, a common ground of values. But I mean, it is frightening to, to, to just witness that nobody is willing to make any concession, to make any position that, we, that would go further in trying to, uh, to solve the humanitarian problem, but I'll, call, I'll, I'll go back to that. And this is... Uh, a very important point of fragility, of weakness, of a United Nations system that was created in order to help the settlement of conflicts and which is unable today to, to deal with that. The second point, which I would like to focus on, is, and it goes, it uh, alluded to what has been said. It is that not at the level of the United Nations Security Council, but at the level of the United Nations uh, General Assembly, the divide between countries condemning at the same time what happened in the Gaza Strip and in Ukraine, but not willing at the same time to, to stick to one position in terms of alliance, is something that has been pointed out by Jean-Maurice. Jean of course, it is uh, important to note that. And I agree with him when he said, nobody wants to stick to a, a, a solid alliance, if I might say, okay? But uh, this is very important. But at the same time, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that this position will be uh, sustainable at the final end. If the conflicts uh, were to be repeated and coming more and more. And as we have just heard by Ambassador Ishii, there are growing powers, I would not say emerging powers, everybody is emerging today. Thank you for this uh, comment. But at the same time, you will have polylateralism and not a multilateral system. You will have new, uh, new powers um, um, representing uh, new positions in the world um, and being very much interested in dealing with the international system. I just uh, want to pick on the on the wisdom of uh, uh, Jean-Maurice Ripert. At, at the very beginning, uh, 20 years ago, China was not willing to join in the multilateral system and be part of the United Nations system and refusing, for example, to be part of the UN keeping forces but now we have seen that uh, China has joined the WTO, the peacekeeping forces that has very important uh, role, and of course the IMF. I mean, uh, the trend is that the emerging, sorry to use this word, powers will be more and more effective in dealing with the international system. And then I'm not sure that uh, not sticking with this or not sticking with that uh, power uh, would not be sustainable very much uh, when it will come to raising power and the new balance of power, um, 
who could be uh, which could be uh, emerging. So uh, this, my third point is that um, the war pattern in um, in Gaza um, reminds me or illustrate very well what Paul have been saying when he said that he has two favorite uh, scenarios. The, the first one on the first on, on the one hand is the Cold War and the second one is the proxy, the proxy war. And we are witnessing this kind of situation. The Gaza Strip war is a, a, a war between Israel and Hamas. But of course, if you put it within the broader scope, and a broader framework, you will witness, of course, the interest of the United States, which is obvious in this case, but also China, but also Russia, but also Turkey. And at the same time, the whole war that is unfolding in this region uh, is, is pointing out to the emergence of a hidden actor. And this hidden actor that play that is playing a very important role in and giving arms and money to all these proxies is Iran. Iran is not on the battleground, but it is on the political battlefield and the military battlefield, backing Hezbollah, backing Hamas, backing the Houthis, backing the, the uh, jihad, the Islamic jihad in, in, in Gaza. So Paul, the, the question is, where are we heading for? I mean, we are between those two and especially uh, what you said justly about the, 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 the Cold War, we could witness it, I mean, coming back in a very subtle manner, which is, I'm not fighting immediately and directly against you, but maybe by proxies. That was the case at the, 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 uh, the Cold War period, the first one, the important one, when the US and the Western world was battling against uh, the, um, the, the, the forces that were supported by China, by, by Russia in Africa. Uh, let me recall the case of Mozambique, of Angola, uh, all these countries that have, uh, the, that have been the scene of um, conflict uh, by, by proxies. Um, the, my four points, it is the fourth one, yes, I think, yeah. It is the, the failure of any regulation system that would compel, not on the political level, but on the humanitarian level, that would compel both, I mean, uh, the Hamas, if, uh, if we could have a leverage on Hamas and on Israel, to respect the standards of warfare. We have been entering in a period in French, we say, en sauvagement a word of uh, being a, a barbarian confrontation between countries. And Jean-Maurice Ripper has rightly uh, pointed out to that fact. And maybe uh, he didn't, I, I didn't, I was not very much successful in making myself understandable when I said that there was a huge discrepancy between the stalemate on the level of the UN uh, Security Council, but not, uh, but, but a kind of, business as usual when it comes to international organization. Uh, the one you, uh, Jean Maurice you praised because they have civil servants which are excellent without dealing, while doing their job, uh, being on the humanitarian level, on the uh, food level, on the, on the um, world trade organization, you mentioned also that. So this is my point. My first point was stating by making my opening remarks, it was that the, the the United Nations secure the system is not completely wrecked. It is it is functioning on the level of international organization as such, dealing with common goods, but not at the political uh, at the political level and especially on human rights. And I agree with Ambassador Rishi when, Ishi when he said, "Well, refugees, terrorism will stem from this situation of conflict." which reminds us very much about the Hedley Bull anarchical society expanding on the, on the level of civil, of civil society also. Uh, my last point, because I, I want to let some room for the discussion, uh, Philippe, so I'm concluding by this uh, fifth point. Uh, it is, um, if we want to 
to go out of the box and not be focused on the conflict and what is happening uh, nowadays immediately on the battlefield, if I might say. It is the incapacity um, of dealing properly with conflicts and especially in order to prevent them. And I, I, I'm, I remind, in, in this case, I have been working at one point with Butchers Butchers Gali at the level of the Francophonie, but before that, Butchers Butchers Gali, the former secretary of the United Nations, uh, have put forth his famous agenda for peace, 1994, and saying the most important thing is to prevent conflict and to work and to work in order uh, to prevent war. What have we, I mean, done? in order to prevent the Ukrainian uh, conflict. It was obvious that we were heading for war. And in the case of Gaza, and this is, I mean, frightening, uh, after the, 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 the Good Friday uh, deal that has put an end to the uh, conflict in the northern part of Ireland in 1998, I mean, the, the Israeli-Arab conflict is the oldest conflict in the world. It is what we call not a frozen conflict, but a protracted conflict. It has been unfolding and going on and on. And what, and what we are witnessing today is the total failure of and the incapacity because of a lot of things. There is no uh, unique cause for that of being very much uh, focused on the mounting threats that are, or the growing threats that at that old time are uh, just uh, um, warning us about uh, a spilling over uh, from conflicts to a, a kind of frozen conflict to a very um, uh, to, to a war, and this is what we are witnessing today in the Gaza Strip. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, with your encyclopedic knowledge, uh, we will never know which part of your uh, presentation uh, we missed, but uh, I know we got something back. So anyway, I also um, would like to say that the, the, this idea of proxy war, which uh, Paul alluded to, is a very interesting one. Yeah. And uh, sadly, this is happening in many parts of the world, including uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, in some ways and including in Europe. And with that, because we have uh, limited time, I will I would like to turn to uh, our colleague Frédéric Charillon, who will uh, perhaps uh, wrap up this uh, this great uh, 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 this succession of uh, excellent presentations by by wonderful speakers, and also perhaps give us a, you know a, a European uh, uh, vision for 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 all of this after hearing uh, you know about the Middle East, uh, East Asia, the United Nations, and and also uh, from. Uh, from Paul, uh, who is now uh, in in Boston, uh, as we as we speak. So, Frederick, uh, please. Thank you, thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you very much to all of you for this very challenging presentation that we could hear uh, just before. You know, there are at least two difficulties. Being uh, the last one to speak, the first one is that many things have been said already, and the second one is that so many people say it several times but the last speaker will talk about that that you have a very a very long agenda if i really have to address everything that was mentioned before but um i will try first of all to to be brief so that we can have a discussion um but i will try to not to wrap it all because it would be impossible because the presentations were so rich that nobody can really wrap them up uh like that but um maybe uh I will try to see and to raise the question with you about how did we, um, what did we miss and how did we reach this point of the kind of demise of multilateralism uh, today? Um, it seems that uh, we have a tension be today between the return of multipolarity uh, and maybe the late, already late multilateralism. Um, and the very dark consequences of a world with multiple crises, and all of you have mentioned and analyzed some of those crises. Joseph just did it about the Gaza uh, tension and, and, and war. Uh, how did we reach uh, the point where we are today? Um, how did we pass from hope uh, some 30 years ago 
uh, to kind of despair. Today, um, maybe uh, we have witnessed three decades of failures. Um, let, us, let us try to come back to that very briefly. We remember the early 90s, um, not the very early 90s with the kind of illusion of a unipolar moment, as a, a very famous article stated it's some years ago, um, but, the, but the hope of a multilateralism restored after the end of the Cold War. Um, we had some hopes that a kind of international community would, uh, would re-emerge uh, in the world. This illusion has been fueled by uh, the international intervention in Kuwait. And in fact, we discovered that Kuwait was well, the war in Kuwait was a kind of anachronism. Uh, we were hoping it would be the future of multilateralism, a deviant state trying to invade its neighbor and the international community united to punish uh, this uh, this rogue uh, aggressor. Uh, in in the case, it was of course Saddam Hussein uh, in 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 Kuwait. We remember the big coalition led by the United States, but with more than 30 countries, including Arab states, including Syria, including the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Egypt. Um, we could hope at the time it would be the future of multilateralism. It was an illusion. Um, of course, the next decade uh, after the, uh, the attacks in the US of 9-11 uh, in 2001 and the war on terror, uh, led by the Bush administration that followed was another type and another taste of multilateralism. It was uni-multilateralism. It was multilateralism only in the American way. It was very different from the coalition in Kuwait. Uh, it was not multilateralism anymore. In fact, it was you are with us or you are against us. We remember those sentences, especially in Europe, when we remember that uh, we remember Condoleezza Rice uh, saying we have to punish France for uh, its stance during the, 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 the Iraqi crisis. Uh, we have to uh, forget about Germany and we have to forgive Russia or something like that. Um, and we remember the neoconservative uh, administration pleading for the demise of international institutions. We remember someone called David Pearl uh, in the United States saying that since the United Nations could not um, abide by the rules and, um, and could not follow the agenda of the United States, then the UN should be replaced by something else. That was, uh, the, 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 these were the words uh, uh, at the time, and it was a first very deep breach in the hopes of a new multilateralism that was born, that had been born a few years before. And then we could witness the return and uh, the age of the strong men, as we used to say today. There are several books published recently about the strong men. Who are the strong men? Putin, probably Trump, of course, Xi Jinping, Erdogan, Netanyahu too, um, probably um, the return of the strong men against multilateralism with a very national and nationalist uh, agenda. Probably the West, as we used to call it, let's say Europe and, and North America, has, have, has made mistakes. Maybe Libya and the intervention uh, in Libya in 2011 was a turning point rising many oppositions in the world, in, in China, in Russia, in the South. We remember the very strong opposition of countries like Turkey, uh, Algeria, South Africa, uh, during the, the, the Western intervention in, um, in Libya. Uh, maybe uh, this was the turning point because it was a moment when multilateralism in the world, especially in the South, was perceived not as a kind of, uh, not as a chance, not as a good strategy and a good method, but maybe it was perceived as a kind of Western strategy to justify interventions um, and mingling uh, in the affairs of other states, of course, linked also to the to what we used to call um, the um, regime change. Uh, 
Um, and maybe from Europe, I, I don't know about uh, your perceptions uh, for those of, of you who come from different regions in the world, but it seems to, to, to me and it seems to many people in Europe that this was a turning point, maybe after Libya, uh, maybe um, the last regime change, um, maybe this was um, a turning point because uh, many um, countries, especially in the South, uh, consider multilateralism as uh, a Western strategy and thus as a bad thing, as a kind of Western uh, stigma. And we could see, we could hear the message of uh, the strong man uh, against Western multilateralism. So after a few years, we could see new interventions in the neighborhood, uh, Russia in um, uh, several times in Georgia, uh, 2008, of course, in Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea to uh, uh, to 2014, um, a very assertive message uh, from China under the rule of Xi Jinping after uh, 2013, uh, but also, as I said, uh, Erdogan and uh, and other strong men. Um, maybe today, uh, what it, what we have in store is not multilateralism anymore but intimidation and even war. And to uh, use the, the, the title of the book of uh, our colleague Hassan Salami, who just published uh, this month, it, are we witnessing the temptation of mass, the temptation uh, of war? Um, today, multilateralism is not a tool, uh, a, a, is not seen as a relevant tool uh, in, in store. So what are we witnessing? What is the situation today? And to, to be very brief, what is the situation today and what can we do? Maybe to restore uh, a, a workable multilateralism. The situation today is the failure of inclusive multilateral diplomacy. The UN could not bring any solution to most of the crises in the world. I totally agree with what was said, especially by uh, Jean-Louis Ripper. The UN is not totally bad of course and it's it, the un can also do many things and the un can be very useful in many uh, in many ways but the un is not seen as a tool to restore peace or to uh, to be a framework for uh, a working multilateral system by many countries in the world so it's a failure of inclusive multilateral diplomacy as joseph just said uh how could we prevent the war in Ukraine. How could we prevent what happened uh, in Israel and Gaza? Um, but also, we can see the failure of club diplomacy, not even the, the, the inclusive uh, multilateral diplomacy, but even smaller examples, smaller experiences of, um, of diplomacy, like the Normandy format. We remember the Normandy format on Ukraine. We remember the five plus one uh, group on Iran. All this has been brought down by Donald Trump. Um, I mean, talking about Iran. We know that the new strongmen dislike multilateralism. We know that what China said about uh, the international uh, rules or the international settlements about uh, territorial claims or disputes in uh, the South China Sea. We know that Israel, uh, what Israel thinks about uh, different uh, international or multilateral or UN uh, advices or um, or statements. Um, so we uh, we have a very difficult time today for multilateralism. Um, we have a radicalization of diplomatic posture and nobody believes anymore in collective security. Uh, and the demise of multilateralism today is probably also the demise of collective uh, security, which is a grave problem. We can witness, I think, the return of, you know, in political science, we a very old theory opposes the interest of milieu, the interest of having a good relation with in the neighborhood, with the interest of possession. We are witnessing the return of the interest of possession. My interest is trying is to try to seize, to take what for the moment belongs uh, to my neighbor. It's my, the interest of possession, which is now stronger than the interest of milieu. My interest is to have a peaceful relation with my neighbor. No. Now, once again, 
many countries think that their interest is to seize as many territories as possible in the neighborhood. Um, another uh, characteristic maybe of the situation today is that we are witnessing maybe the birth, the, the starting of the beginning of uh, a competition between several multilateralism. Um, maybe we are, we, are, we are heading towards a kind of flurry multilateralism, if I may say. China is obviously trying to mount uh, a kind of multilateralism of its own and to compete with older institutions, multilateral institutions, by building, creating new ones, um, new corporations, of course, among southern countries, the, ex the extension, um, the, uh, the enlargement, sorry, of the, the, the club of the BRICS is uh, another signal of this uh, plurimultilateralism. Maybe we will have two, maybe three, uh, different uh, patterns and uh, different clubs uh, for multilateralism in the coming years. Uh, this is the situation today. What can we do to avoid that? A, a plurimultilateralism, which means a competition between several uh, perceptions and several proposals, several patterns of multilateralism would be the end of collective security. Can we still avoid that? For instance, is there a role for Europe? The question was raised a few minutes ago, um, especially if Donald Trump uh, comes back to the White House in a few months. Europe will feel very much alone with some allies, maybe, of course, Japan, and of course, democrat, some democracies in Asia, and, and many other ones in the world. But we will feel very much alone to try to revive a multilateralism. Um, is the, the, the European strategic autonomy, which is really uh, supported uh, and promoted by countries like France, is it still alive? Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. I'm not sure that we, we, we know in Europe that we have to revive this strategic autonomy, especially if Donald Trump comes back. Uh, but if if it is the case, I mean, if uh, um, Europe is still uh, able to, to do something like that, Europe should plead first for a more inclusive uh, diplomacy. We cannot dismiss, um, we cannot refuse to talk with all their perceptions, and especially in the South. A diplomacy of listening. We know, to take the, the title of the book of another diplomat, um, Maurice Gaudemontagne, that the others do not think the same as us. They don't think like us. They think otherwise. They have different perceptions. Maybe we don't like those perceptions. Maybe we disagree in the name of values, in the name of our an political analysis, but we have to admit that they think differently. Um, we have to admit that uh, multilateralism means also a multilateralism of thought and perceptions. Uh, not only a, a technical multilateralism meeting and trying to find technical solutions. It's also a multilateralism of thought and perception. I think it's the only condition today to try to avoid what I think would be the most dangerous uh, situation, a kind of competition between multilateralism uh, in the world. Is Europe able to do that? Not alone, but without uh, the United States in the case of a return of Donald Trump? This I don't know. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick. You, you've really uh, covered a lot of ground and that was very helpful because it, it, you know we, we, we didn't speak much about Europe. Now we only have about 10 minutes. So can I go back to each speaker uh, starting with Paul, perhaps, and, and, and just pick uh, one particular uh, point they would like to emphasize, having listened to everyone. And I would just ask for Joseph, perhaps, to answer the question that was uh, uh, asked about uh, the, the, the October 7th uh, massacre and the, the role of the UN uh, RWA. And, and, and uh, was it, was it uh, something that we could have... Uh, uh, planned or, 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 you know, did we know in advance and, and uh, was it uh, some kind of uh, naivete on the part of, uh, of, of the international community? But shall we go uh, back in the, in the same order with uh, 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 Paul, uh, uh, Jean-Maurice, uh, uh, Mazar and, and Joseph, please? But just for 
very brief comments. Thank you. I, I, I will be very brief. I want it will be three points, but very brief. First of all, um, Joseph mentioned Headley Bull, and I want to make one scholarly point, um, which might be of interest to some people, certainly including Joseph, that in a sense, what my book's trying to do is put some kind of philosophical principle foundations behind Headley Bull. And I draw on the Scottish Enlightenment, but I might as well, and actually in a future book will, draw on the tradition of French liberalism that runs through Montesquieu, Constant, Tocqueville, and then very importantly, Raymond L, who I think has a lot to say to our current um, predicament. So I, I think actually kind of getting into the Anglosphere, the traditions of French liberalism are important. At the other end of the spectrum, I think one of the things, Philippe, that this discussion has illustrated is that we are now in a world where the kind of policy and scholarly mental silos that were comfortable during decades of peace um, are actually not sustainable in, in today's world. That in the policy sphere, I actually don't think you can do my old job without being not expert in, but sensitive to and literate in um, kind of foreign policy things. And I'll give an illustration of that. When I was Deputy Governor of the Bank of England during the crisis, someone walked into my room and said, the Federal Reserve, the United States have just refused India a line of credit. The details don't matter. My response was, don't they realize that India is going to be a power? That was in 2009. And the third thing, there's been one absence from our discussion which is multinational corporations. And I, I worry that far too few leaders of multinational corporations um, have got their heads around the kind of, of situations they may face, which at its most cr crudest and most juvenile is having to choose. And something I was involved in far more crises than I would like to have been. Something I observed about crisis managers is that they're much better at it if they've kind of thought about and daydreamed about the circumstances in which they may find themselves. And there was a recent very big business leader in Europe who said, um, well, decoupling, for us, decoupling, they're a giant manufacturer. Decoupling from China is unthinkable. Well, it is only unthinkable if decoupling from the United States is thinkable, which actually means they hadn't thought about it. And I think that um, taking this debate to the multinational corporation world will be tremendously important both in Japan and Korea, Australia, but also you know, basically among the rich democracies. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, Jean-Maurice? Yes, thank you, Philippe. Just three remarks. First, I would like to say publicly what I wrote. Thanks to Joseph to have pointed out the the very negative role that Iran is 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 playing today. Because Iran is the real winner of the war in Syria. Uh, we have now this 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 rainbow of of powers uh, supported by powers of of informal powers and structures supported by Iran uh, from 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 Tehran to to Beirut. And I think an evolution that we have to. To, to stress because, of course, Iran is not a friend of multilateralism. Secondly, of course, Gordo Montagne is right. They don't think like us. We know that when you are diplomats. Uh, should we take into account in the new multilateralism, Frédéric, uh, all of their ideas? Uh, my answer is very clear. No, when it comes to the values and ideas, supposedly uh, values uh, put forward by the negative powers, by China, for instance, when it's questioning the basis of human rights. I still think, and I'm naive and stupid, certainly, but I still think that uh, human rights are not Western rights. I've been enough in, in war zones and, and working with refugees in camps. Human rights are universal. I don't know a single human being who agrees with the violations of its own rights. And who are we to deny to anyone the capacity to do so? So I think we have to stand firm on some of our values. And of course, we have to make compromises on some others. I would refer to something we did never mention, which is, in my view, is very interesting, is the, the 
Canadian concept of of um, of um, uh, human being. You know, the human the human rights should be the rights of the human beings and the human security concept that goes with it. So perhaps my conclusion would say would be to say that revitalization of um, multilateralism and of the UN system should be based on this notion of uh, human security. Thank you very much. Very brief and sharp comments um, as a, a concluding remark. Uh, turning to uh, Maza, please. Thank you. Uh, human security, human dignity is uh, Japan's original, I think. But anyway, quick uh, quick two or three points. First point is, uh, I think, uh, to follow up Frederick's point, competition, competition of multilateralism, I think that's inevitable. But the point is, I think both authoritarian regime and uh, liberal democracy regime face with the same problem. I think that's quite domestic. It's a, it's a kind of a difference between rich and poor. So whichever system uh, solves this issue uh, more successfully will gain uh, more support internationally as well. So I, I think our most important task is deal with this uh, difference between rich and poor, which is happening everywhere. And then China has its own way of dealing with it. We do have our own way of dealing with it, which is more successful, is the issue we're going to face. And uh, second is uh, uh, we are learning in this part of the world a lot from uh, Ukraine. Why the, 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 you know, the, the deterrence uh, failed? And then what should we do to stop China from invading into Taiwan? But our, our conclusion so far is I think we have a better chance to stop China from invading into, into Taiwan. And uh, I, I, I need five more minutes to talk about this, so I stop here. L last point is uh, uh, access of uh, bad guys. Once again, uh, Russia, Iran, China, and let us not forget the North Korea. I think North Korea is helping Russia fight war in uh, Ukraine. More important from our viewpoint, Russia is giving a lot of uh, new technologies to, to North Korea. And their capability has been really improved by the huge support coming from Russia. So it, it's going both ways. So nowadays, uh, when we talk about the third front, Ukraine, Gaza, and Asia, there are three or four third fronts, like uh, DPRK's uh, invasion, uh, Russians possibly invasion into Japan, South China Sea, and Taiwan. So I think we, we are going to see a more multi, multiple uh, crises uh, uh, all over the world. So, and our job is to stop it from happening, I think, as, as uh, Frederick was saying. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And also the Sino-Indian uh, tensions, which, uh, as, as Paul uh, pointed out at the beginning, sure. it has That's been true. a serious uh, shift. Uh, Joseph, please. A few words of conclusion. So, sorry, yes. Uh, very quickly, uh, Philippe, I didn't catch the question you put to me concerning the Gaza Strip, but I would like to make a few remarks and uh, comments, three exactly, very quickly. Uh, the first point is to go along with uh, what uh, Paul have been saying, has been say, said uh, concerning the philosophical foundations of the new system, which is very much interesting. And it seems to me, but I didn't read his book, that he is um, opposing to tradition, uh, the one which came, which comes from Thomas Hobbes and the other one from Montesquieu and trying to strike a balance between both of them. I don't know if this is the case, but trying to give a legitimacy to the uh, international political system. And this is very much interesting, but um, yes. I would say that, uh, it, the, the kind of solution that we are looking for is a kind of uh, liberal tradition, very pragmatic one, sticking yeah. to human rights, of course, but trying also to be very much efficient and legitimacy by itself. It's not so much uh, a reason for legitimacy. You might be right, but have no say or no influence whatsoever in order to make things go the, 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 the right way, if I might say, uh, quote, unquote. Okay, this is the first point, but we, we lack of time, of course. Uh, 
uh, in order to discuss this issue. The second one is I would go also along with the um, ambassador Ishii. I very much, I was, uh, we worked uh, and Jean-Maurice Ripper maybe uh, um, have a, a remembrance of that uh, on the uh, human security notion. It has completely disappeared now, but uh, human security was Japan, Canada, and Norway, I think, uh, initiative that has been taken at the beginning of the, the, the it was in 2002, I think, at, the, at that time. Um, and the responsibility to protect. I put the question of the responsibility to protect, which is tremendous. I know all the criticism that we could have concerning this notion. And the French diplomacy has failed uh, when it goes, when it went to Libya in order to protect the people there. And it has come to a complete uh, disaster at the final end. But I mean, it is, uh, we are dignifying the human being when we say that some, when some regimes are killing people, uh, carrying out genocide, uh, not to abandon them. And the responsibility to protect has to be, uh, thought over, if I might say, in order to, to return. And yes, my third and final remark to, oh, I agree totally with uh, my colleague uh, Frédéric uh, concerning the multi-pluralilateralism. But my question would be the same that Ambassador uh, Ishii, how to push the inevitable way of contracting partnerships on the level of regions of the world and to push them to the mainstream of the United Nations of a universal system. We have a chapter eight, I think, in the Charter of the United Nations that it's very much, that favor very much the uh, questions of working within regional borders or regional cooperation. But at the final end, the ultimate goal of the whole system is to go back to some centrality uh, I mean, it has no sense to to be very much in favor of plurilateralism is it is if it is to favor a kind of uh, a multipolar world becoming much more multilateral. This would be a catastrophe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph. That was uh, extremely clear. I think Frederick, uh, you you probably don't have time to to. Uh, just one word, just one word. one word I have to leave you, um, yeah. because Cool called me to go and take my daughter with sick at school. <laughs> just two words, very quickly. I, just uh, to answer to Jean-Marie, of course, we, I, we totally agree that we we have to stand for our values, uh, starting with human rights. I just think that, um, you know, this, and I know it's not your case, but I know that the neo, I know it's your case to defend our values, but... Uh, I disagree with the neoconservative method, and I know it's not your case, uh, consisting of refusing to talk with the powers we disagree with. Um, and so, of course, we, we have, it's not relativism what, what I was proposing. It's not like everything is equal and we have to respect that. Of course not. But, but we have to, but this is the world as it is. You know, uh, if we want to be a realist, not in, in uh, the sense of the realist school necessarily, but uh, we know that we, we disagree with some powers. So last point, um, again, about the role of who can do that, who can fix uh, multilateralism, democracies, but not only democracies, we will not have a, a, only a pure democratic multilateralism. It's an illusion. So we have to talk with everyone, everybody. Who can revive? Uh, dialogue and cooperation. Yes, maybe a, a coalition with Europe and other democracies. We have to to broaden the the spectrum of the coalition of the of the willing uh, to revive multilateralism. I think, but who who can be our first and most relevant partners for that? And I think this is the key question of the future uh, of the next month and years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Allow me to make a few very brief points uh, in, 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 in terms of conclusion. I think we all agree that uh, we all agree that the global South uh, does not exist. Uh, and there are multiple South and uh, we've heard uh, much about that, uh, no less from Ambassador Ishii, who knows uh, Asia well. And uh, I found it really uh, intriguing that, uh, you know, uh, he, he put uh, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, 
um, and of course India as possible challengers of the of the South that uh, perhaps the the current BRICS uh, is, is seems to be showing at the moment, particularly since the last uh, summit, uh, which was very much uh, in the hands of uh, of China. Um, secondly, it seems multilateralism is not dead. Uh, there are structures. Uh, we, we heard from uh, Jean-Maurice, uh, which we know, but they, are, they, they may be dysfunctional, but we need to make them work, implement. And, uh, and there are different actors, not just... Uh, not just states, uh, but also uh, non-state actors. There are smaller organizations. Now, of course, some of them are challenging the international order, including uh, the, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, uh, the BRICS uh, um, and, and others. Uh, we've, we did not mention the, the concepts that China is trying to introduce, such as the uh, common uh, security initiative or things like that, but um, uh, indeed there are there's some uh, theories that that China is trying to to um, introduce in in our language. Not that we always understand what they mean. Um, and 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 last but not least, um, when we speak about the UN um, and the absence of a, of, a, of a common ground, well, there are sort of. A, uh, groups of countries that that certainly uh, uh, agree with each other, and 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 that's I'm going back to to Paul's book, uh, uh, and he said you know we need to maximize our friendships uh, 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 around the world. This is the the idea of like-minded countries and and uh, or, or, or or groups of countries, and and in fact. What the, the current uh, apparent chaos has shown us is perhaps that, in fact, it has strengthened uh, NATO, it, uh, it has strengthened the Europeans. In many ways, it has strengthened uh, the transatlantic community and the relations between Japan and, 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 and the West. Um, and it has strengthened uh, some of the countries that uh, Maza Ishii was talking about, uh, who are now more outspoken, certainly that's the case with Indonesia, and, and certainly the case of India. I'm just back from New Delhi, uh, from the Resina Dialogue, and that was very much uh, the impression that the, the South was talking to the South, and, and the South was talking to the rest of the world, which is basically, you know, the West. But anyway, having said that, it's uh, it's uh, 10 minutes past two, so we've we've overlapped, uh, we've, um, we've overspoken, but we've, uh, we've had a good time. I'm, I'm sure um, the audience had as well. Let me thank uh, 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 warmly uh, all the speakers, um, um, Ambassador uh, Ishii, Ambassador Ripper, uh, Sir Paul Tucker of Harvard University, uh, Professor Joseph Maila, Professor um, Frederick Chouagnon. You have made this, this event really uh, fascinating. And uh, thank you so much for your time.